case you're a guest with us today and didn't understand exactly what Daniel was talking about, Daniel, that, that was fantastic. We are in the midst of a series, Life and Community, and over this weekend, it was <laughs> a sermon was preached, was it not? It, it was. It was living in community, and we've been working on a thing called the Two Hands Project. It was uh, it's a, a nonprofit organization that they came up with this idea of uh, as couples are getting ready to adopt a child and are raising money for that, why don't we help widows with the other hand in, in the process? And so as the shepherds are preparing to adopt an eight-month-old uh, girl from China, that, that, that was helping the, the orphan. This is helping the widow up in northeast uh, Huntsville. And it was just fantastic. Um, had about 20 folks over there on Friday kind of doing some prep and, and cleaned up and getting the house ready. And then about 50 folks that came and worked outside in the rain and worked indoors and the, the house is getting close. And uh, those two ladies are just excited. And I, I, I was excited for them, but I was also excited for the church family and how so many people have pitched in and uh, have worked to uh, not only work on the house, but get different contractors to drop by and to, to offer up some different things. It's just been a fantastic experience. And uh, if you want to help out, there's still some more work to do and some finances and stuff. If you want to uh, to get get involved with that, talk with me or, or talk with the shepherds or someone else, and we'll we'll definitely get you plugged in on that. On the game show, The Family Feud, this hosted by Steve Harvey. You guys have, have seen it for years. It used to be Richard Dawson. Uh, but the, the contestants were recently asked, this is in a show in 2012, to answer and, and try to get the, the, the top answers to this question. When someone mentions the king... To whom might he or she be referring? With 100 people surveyed, these were the top four answers that were up there. A little over 8 and 10 said Elvis. Just 7 out of 100 people said Jesus or, or God, barely eclipsing MLK and the Burger King. Well, if you add it up, it doesn't quite get to 100, and some of you are going to sit through the rest of the sermon and go, who were the other four? Well, I'll go ahead and tell you because I had to research it. Uh, the other four were the King of Pop, Michael Jackson, King Kong, Henry VIII, and Billie Jean King. Uh, for some of you, you have no idea who Billie Jean King is, and we'll explain that later. All right, but we sing about uh, Jesus being the King of King and Lord of Lords, and of course it comes from, from Revelation chapter 19. And if that's true, He is our King and He's the Lord of Lord, well then it, it serves us to, to think that we're subjects within the kingdom do we think of our life in that way and if we're subjects within the kingdom everything we do benefits the kingdom and do we think about when we drive onto the arsenal and go, go through the gate and checkpoint and everything and begin your day work or or when you walk onto campus or even later in the day when you're going to do groceries or walking the dog around do you see that as a kingdom mission that from the time you get up to the time you lie down, that you're in the service of the king. It, is that our mindset? Or do we kind of just say, well, well, yeah, Jesus is the king of king of lord of lords. He, he's in control of all this. And, and we, we come and we'll sing about it to kind of be reminded about that. But then we just kind of go about our business. Because if he's king and we're part of his kingdom, we are on mission. And our life is called to be different. And so that's kind of a way for us to be thinking about things. So we are in the third week of our series about life and community. And I want us to talk about descriptors. One word to, to describe who Jesus, is, who Jesus is, who the church is. And last week we talked about the idea of covenant. And that for, first and foremost, we're a covenant community. And so we see what Jesus did on our behalf at the cross. And so we join into that covenant like Jesus did symbolically participating in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus as we step down into the, the baptistry waters. And, and so we join into that covenant and it's sealed by our Heavenly Father with the gift of the Holy Spirit. This starts taking over our lives and we start growing and maturing into God, who God is calling us to be. And so we, we have to ask ourselves, okay, so we've all joined into this covenant and we believe that Jesus is 
who he says he was, and, and, and we believe about his work on the cross, are we just a covenant people? Are we just a people that are good with God? Because if we answer yes, then what's our job? Well, our job is to build the campfire, link arms, and sway back and forth, and kumbaya it until Jesus returns. Because we're a group that has figured it out, and that's it. But that's not what we see in Scripture. If you look, every time people covenant with God, well then, they're kind of given kingdom responsibilities. So they have said, I'm with the king, I want to be a part of his kingdom, and then God sends them out doing kingdom type stuff. So last week, we looked at Abraham, and we looked at Noah, and just briefly looked at those two people. They covenanted, covenanted with God, and then he says, all right, now I want you to be my people. I, your descendants are going to spread out. And you're going to be a people that's going to call all other peoples back to me. You, you have a responsibility because you're a part of this kingdom. We look at the, the children of Israel and think about them as they're in slavery. And they're, they're calling out for 400 years and God sends them to deliver so Moses comes in, and you remember all the different plagues, the flies and the blood and the gnats and all these different things. And, and it culminates in Moses going and warning Pharaoh, if you do not let the people go, then it's going to be death to the firstborn. And so to prepare the Hebrew people, they go and they grab the first Passover lamb, as it later be called, and, and they sacrifice this animal and they prepare this meal around the table. And they take that blood. Remember what they do? They grab the branches and they, they start wiping it up on the door frame all the way around so that the death angel would pass over. So in a sense, they're creating a community, a community that's now defined by this covenant that they've made with God. And so uh, the Lord delivers them, and so they're ready to start this new journey. And so they head out of Egypt, and you remember the army's coming behind them, and they, they get trapped at the Red Sea, and... You know, they're, they're panicking. Oh, why did you bring us out here just to die in the desert? Well, you know, it opens up and they cross through and they're like, yeah, that's right, we've trusted God the whole time. And so they get on the other side and God says, now, let's bring this together. And if you're going to be my covenant people, let's go up on the mountain and let's carve out some stone and write down what it means to be my people. Because you're going to be my representative. You're no longer slaves. You're delivered now you're going to go to a new land, a land I promised your forefathers. You're going to be my people. So they've coveted, and now they're part of the kingdom. And they're going to be his kingdom representatives. Well, of course, we know that they broke covenant with him and paid the price in exile. We have to understand that life and community, that we've got this whole idea that we're covenanting with God, but we're also part of a kingdom. He's our king, and we receive a kingdom calling to be filled out. So the, the people are, are now off in exile, and they, they've been retur they're returning. And as we've been reading from these psalms and also from the prophets, something big is going to happen. God's going to come back. He's going to rescue. And so they're waiting for this new king to come. But I wonder, with reading what we've read, if they misunderstood or disappointed almost when they encountered Jesus. Because definitely they had in mind what they thought the king was going to be. In reality, he's going to show them a whole new sense of what it means to be king, what his kingdom's about, and what our calling is going to be. So that's what I want us to understand a little bit today. So we're going to do a little bit different format. I've been able to, to sit in on a class that a couple of guys have been doing, Eric Cohue and Andy Blackston. And as I sat there last week, I said, that's exactly what we're covering next week. Why don't you guys come and we're going to have kind of a roundtable discussion and just talk a little bit about king, kingdom, and our calling. So you guys come on up here, and I want to kind of wrestle. Now, I, I'm putting them in a bad position because they're doing this over the whole semester, our whole quarter, and then we're going to sum up everything that they're doing in a quarter in about 20 minutes. So we're going to do the best we, we can. So you guys grab your mic here. And Andy and his wife are, are here. They're, they normally worship over the light, uh, but they have agreed to be with us today. So thank you for coming over and doing this. And you guys know Eric, and we're so glad that, that you guys are here at Twickenham and all that you mean to us. 
Andy, you know, when you and I and Eric met um, for lunch earlier this week, you mentioned but before we can really understand this whole idea of what Jesus was doing and his story in the kingdom, first we have to start at the end, so to speak, with Revelation chapter one, uh, 21 and the new creation. Just kind of run with that. And we're, we're, I, I told these guys, it's just going to be the three of us talking and you guys are going to listen in. But it, it's, it's really good stuff. But just share some of the stuff we talked about over lunch. Yeah, when, when we decided to teach this class um, in um, how do you start teaching a class and how do you start figuring out what it means to be the people of God. And uh, I think it was Stephen Covey that said, start with, uh, begin with the end in mind uh, for all you business folks, right? Uh, so we went right to the end and we decided to work backwards. And um, we went to Revelation 21. It's this unbelievable portrayal of what the future is going to be um, and it's this future of new creation it's this future of God making all things new right. and um, it's a powerful image uh, I often tell my students if you're working a puzzle what's the first thing you want um, some people say I want the, the straight edged pieces you know um, what I always say is I want the picture I want to know what the puzzle is supposed to end up looking like. So you grab the, the lid of the box. I grab the box, yeah. and I say, okay, now I take this piece, and I look at the box, and I say, okay, this, this piece makes sense within the overall framework of what God's doing. And So when, when you think about the restoration of all things and God being king, um, the two temptations that, that we often have is God is just king of my heart. Right. Um, it's kind of this interiorization of, you know, it, it's kind of hard to believe God is the king of the earth. And, and Jesus, you know, I think in Matthew 28, uh, you know, it's easier to believe Jesus is the king of heaven. Right. Man, it is tough to look, to watch the news and think Jesus is the king of the earth. Yeah, he's, he came down, did his thing, and he's just sitting up there just kind of waiting. Yeah, you know? so, so the two ends that... That, we, that I've tended to, and I don't want to project on everybody else, maybe you guys can relate to it, is Jesus is king of individual hearts, right? Uh, or Jesus' kingdom is otherworldly, okay? So uh, Jesus came, uh, everybody thought he was going to set up a kingdom that happened here on earth, and that didn't happen like everybody thought, so now Jesus' kingdom is in the sweet by and by. And we bide our time, we, make, we manage our sin, and then hopefully we can escape uh, into the sweet by and by. And I just don't think that's the message uh, that Isaiah tells from Isaiah 11 through all the way to Isaiah 65. And then uh, John, who picks up on Isaiah, all John's doing is channeling Isaiah's vision of not just the restoration of my soul. Right. It's this cosmic res restoration where Jesus is not only king of me, he's actually king over the principalities and the powers that are carving up the world. Okay, Eric, hop in here because we read some of these passages and prophecies, and I, I wonder if the Jews really were expecting um, something different than what Jesus came to provide and model and show. And definitely see all throughout his ministry, there were times where he had to say, that's not the kingdom that I came. And so it, explain kind of some of this idea of well, already, but then not yet, because a, a lot of what he was talking about was going to be fulfilled. Just, just kind of share a little bit about that. Yeah, I think uh, what you have with the Jewish eschatological framework or their understanding of the end of days are passages like we've been reading all morning. There are hundreds of through uh, Isaiah, through Malachi, even King David is listed as a prophet, uh, his imagery of the restoration of all things, the day of the Lord, as most translations read. Oftentimes, those translations in the Hebrew are the end of days. So you have most of the Jews, not all the Sadducees were an exception to this, but most of the Jews, their eschatology believed in the resurrection of the dead, a messianic rule, and the restoration of all things. And we read a little bit from Daniel. Uh, Daniel 2 is the vision given to Nebuchadnezzar that God reveals through the prophet Daniel the that this rock, rock yeah. interestingly enough, when it struck, would destroy all the nation states at once. So you have all these passages that 
or the linchpin for their framework. So when Jesus comes as the suffering servant, okay, that are interwoven all the way through yep. the prophets. When we read the prophets, we see juxtaposed, that's a big word for just interwoven together, both suffering and glory. But, suffering but in a and sense, glory. they kind of turn down the volume on some of the suffering part and are more uh, turning up the volume on the deliverer. And so you see that at um, when they go in feeding of the 5,000, trying to make him king by force. So all that's happening. Yes, so I, I think because of their also worldly framework of using the powers and principalities to obtain that kingdom as opposed to submitting to the Messiah's way yep. of joining with him in suffering to receive future glory that the New Testament authors talk about uh, repetitively, then they're not starting with the inside out. They right. want to start the outside and, wor and, and not clean the inside or allow the inside to be subjects of the kingdom. In a sense, uh, you know, you have uh, uh, the first temptation back in Genesis, us wanting to become like God, and God yep. sort of writes the story and says, okay, I'll show you what it's like to be me, and he sends, sends his son Jesus, who is the suffering servant and a lamb, but also through those prophecies, we see the Lion of Judah, uh, we see the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, that if we want to be in line with the New Testament authors, we say, hey, we have an eager expectation for the return of the King, right. which leaves us in that tension that Andy's talked about so well in class of the already not mm -hmm. yet. We have made a allegiance and a pledge to a coming kingdom that was manifested itself at the first advent of Jesus that will be totally fulfilled and consummated at his right. second advent. So really what they were missing were, were the two advents, uh, two comings of the Messiah. Okay, Andy, hop in here for just a minute uh, because as we begin thinking of the kingship of Jesus and how our story kind of intersects his story, oftentimes we, we focus just on the event at, at the cross and what that sacrifice means to us and don't keep that in balance with what Eric's talking about, about this expectation of his return. And so why do these two events have to be held in, in tension when we think about Jesus? That it's not just looking back to what happens on the cross. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. And, you know, for me, uh, growing up as a Christian, I had such a reduced uh, notion of what the gospel was. Um, and it was so small. Um, and, and I was informed by a very reformed kind of in the tradition of Luther and Calvin of, you know, what happened on the cross was this uh, exchange between God, this um, penal substitutionary atonement where God's wrath is satisfied. Um, it kind of plays out um, as, you know, God's mad, God's got to hit somebody, and um, he hit his son instead of me, so out of gratitude, I serve him. And um, that, that's not how the cross has been understood traditionally. Uh, if you go back, the Catholics actually have a much richer view of what was happening on the cross with the Christus Victor. Right. Um, and Paul, if you read Galatia, or, uh, uh, Colossians, he brings in this notion that on the cross, that Christ was actually disarming mm -hmm. the principalities and the powers. Um, in the world um, as an alternative way to be in the world. And so uh, it's cosmic. It, it's, it's the, Jesus came to announce more than stop drinking, stop cussing. Um, he, he, the law did that. Uh, they had that in place, kind of a moral guide. Jesus is announcing he is king of creation. And that is a totally different way to understand um, what he was doing. And so when Jesus, uh, and, and I don't want to reduce the piety movement. In, in, um, or like, what happened like, at the cross. Or what happened at the cross. Uh, Absolutely. Because uh, there is, he is opening up space, but it, the cross cannot be reduced to what Dallas Willard would call the gospel of sin, sin management. Right. I'm just managing my sin every day, and let's... You know, let's hope I have a little bit you know, less sin than more sin. The cross was Jesus' way of dethroning the current powers. And unfortunately, much to our dismay, uh, that's the story that he invites us to enter into. And so it becomes uh, 
yes, salvation, but also transformation. And so that's where this tension comes in of, yes, we've been saved, but, you know, in 1 Corinthians 15.2, it says, by this gospel you're saved. It took place on the cross, but then also Philippians 2.12, but continue to work out your salvation. So it's this act at the cross, but as we're, we're waiting for this, we're in kingdom times right now, and so we're holding these two things in tension. Continue to allow what happened at the cross to change us as a people. Um, and it, it seems that all throughout the gospel, Jesus had to explain and re-explain what he means by the kingdom of God. Both of you guys just shared just a little bit of what Jesus had in mind when he talked about kingdom, and he was calling people to, to, to join. Just kind of share a little bit. Well, I think the, the calling, I, I'm going to go to Acts, the calling is for us to be witnesses of the resurrection and the gospel of the kingdom, as Jesus says in Matthew 24, that would be preached to the ends of the earth. Right. And so we've got a calling to get that message of the kingdom is near. He demonstrated that, his power over nature, his power over creation, his power over uh, healing, his, his, his power over all these things. He demonstrated that, and he was the first fruits, as Paul says, of the resurrection of the dead. So that's our message that we go out to the ends of the world with. Jesus could have, have healed everybody on the planet. He could have, have fed everybody on the planet. He said he's just given a, a taste, he's an He's the appetizer. first fruit, first yep. example. Yep. Of, so a lot of these passages we've been reading and everything, we should be longing for the day we are freed from the curse and the sin and the destruction that the devil and, and his people bring. And right. so, so we should be an alternative community to what we see uh, acting out on a daily basis in uh, the evil principalities and powers, not only in Huntsville or Alabama, but we see it in Syria, we see it all across the world. We should demonstrate an alternative community yeah. and be the witness for the consummation of the kingdom. Yeah, and, and even, well, I think we missed some of the, um, just how inflammatory it was to go the extra mile, to turn the other cheek, to sit at the foot of the table instead of the head of the table. And Andy, this also has impacts our walk. It, it's not just what Jesus did in, in explaining this community. It also impacts our calling as to how we enter into that. We look at um, the story of, of Saul in, in Acts chapter 9, and you know, Jesus comes down on the road to Damascus and stops him dead in his tracks and says, I, I want you to go into to town. And so then he has this conversation with Ananias. You've got to go connect with Saul. And he's like, Saul, I, I don't want to go. He persecutes people. No, this is a me. In Acts chapter 9, verse 15, it says, The Lord says to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings before the people of Israel. And so, well, that sounds pretty good. So he's been given this kingdom calling. But then you kind of follow that up with, with verse 16. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Talk to us a little bit about discipleship as out, how that plays into this idea of kingdom calling. Yeah. Um, we're called into the story, the meta narrative of Jesus. That's what our baptism um, symbolizes. Right. Um, our baptism is, is not some way to, quote, go to heaven when we die, as much as it is being uh, put into a whole new way of understanding who we are. So um, just as Jesus... Uh, suffers on the cross and just as Jesus resurrects from the dead so also Jesus invites us into that story right and that story becomes our story um, and so these events of cross and resurrection are more than one-time events that happen to Jesus they actually become the paradigm through which we see all of reality each and every day take up our cross that's right and, and, and so we're in you know, when, when, when we're in the tension of, of a kingdom that is both here and coming, uh, Jesus said, let the wheat and the weeds grow together. Uh, what, what's the first impulse in that story? They want to rip those weeds out because uh, we, we want to triumph. And, and we, I don't know about you, but I tend, you know, in the social gospel kind of did this, is we're going to go out and we're going to run out there and we're going to solve the world's problems. 
Um, and start calling people weeds. But anyway, yeah, go ahead. Uh, and there's, there's, a, there's a definite true impulse to that because the gospel is a political, social, sure. internal. It, the gospel encompasses as wide as creation. You, you go back and you think about how wide is creation. Every dynamic of creation is encompassed by the gospel. And so the key question for us as we live in between the times is what is our ethic? What is our position in a world where um, the powers are defeated and are being defeated? Yep. And um, you got to go to Revelation chapter 5 to get this because uh, the, those churches were under the curse of the Roman Empire. And in Revelation chapter 4, um, John has received a vision and he passes it on and he rips the veil back. And despite all the appearances, we have God on the throne. And that's kind of like John saying, okay, go watch the news. Go look at what's going on in Syria. Go look at all the social ills. And before you get down, let me show you what true reality is. This that's is where that's it's failed. Yep. Is let, me, let me take this down, mm -hmm. and let's, let's see God is on the throne. Okay, and, and we're going to have to believe that in faith. Because that becomes then the, the lens and the filter through which we view everything That's else. That's right. And then you, you, you link that to 21, Revelation 21. But the next chapter, there's weeping because who can open the scroll? And you would think uh, of all the images that John would choose would be some warrior riding on a horse it's the uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a sword. And we are going to slay all the bad guys. Yep. And what you have is possibly the weakest image that you could ever come up with. You can't come up with a weaker image is what John sees as a lamb that's been slain. And that's John's way of saying, okay, I understand, I understand, I understand, but listen, it's the way of Jesus. This is not right. some theory. You know, right. this, this is the way of Jesus lived on the ground that precedes uh, the resurrection. Okay, last thing. We've only got a couple minutes. Uh, we were talking over lunch. You talked about one of the greatest sins that you feel is when folks that have intersected the cross message yet to, de they, they don't continue developing, and so they're not using their, their talents, their time, and their treasure to advance the kingdom. Speak about that just briefly. Yeah, um, acts of omission and acts of commission. There's, you know, in my mind, there's two types of sins. There's the, the sin that we go commit. But then there's this whole other dimension of sin that is things we should be doing that we're not. Um, and when Jesus says uh, that you're salt and light, it's really interesting. He doesn't say, he says you are salt and light. Mm -hmm. And salt functions to preserve the goodness of the world. So if we huddle and cuddle and sing kumbaya, right. literally that is a sin in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, if you read the, the calling that Jesus has for the church. Um, for the people who go out and live out the kingdom. And, and this is an important point for me is I can't change the world, nor is that my job. God has not called me to change the world. He will do that at his second advent. He's called me and you and us as a community to bear faithful witness. Right. And so when, the when, when you go and you, all right, the, the project of restoration uh, that, that you guys have practiced this weekend, it's a beautiful manifestation of new creation. Mm -hmm. A beautiful manifestation of the future reality. It's Revelation 21 popping up right in the middle yeah. of the old world, of the fallen world. And it testifies to the principalities and the powers that there is an alternative reality that has been launched. The fact that me and him are sitting on the same stage if you know anything about Madison Academy, is a, a, a very much an act of new creation. <laughs> I'm the basketball coach at Madison Academy. I wait to get all my players from this guy. And, uh, and it hasn't, you know, the football-basketball relationship at Madison Academy has not always been great. When I first got there, it wasn't real good. Uh, and then this guy came, and uh, the Lord sent him our way, and uh, Mr. Burton said, hey, take this guy out to eat on his interview. And, and we talked maybe one second about sports. The whole thing was about the kingdom. And uh, so we're, I was just thinking that. We're sitting here, and 
and literally is an act of new creation, God doing something new in the, in the middle of the old. And, and that's a powerful image, you know, to continue to bear faithful witness. Yep. Let's show these guys our appreciation. Thank you very much. And Eric, based on the scores on Friday night, you can go ahead and let the, the starters in basketball go on over. So, you know, as we transition into our time of communion, I want us to think about something. I want us to go back to that, that faithful night when we had the first communion. Because this really is a reality of, of showing the difference between what sometimes what man has in mind with his kingdom versus what Jesus had in mind when he was coming to model about the kingdom to come. You know, after they celebrate the Passover feast together in the upper room, well, they, they start heading together as, as a group, and they head over to the Garden of, of Gethsemane. You remember on the Mount of Olives? And he asks the 11, who's gone? Judas. He, he's already uh, slipped out to do what he's going to do and, and get his, his silver in exchange for turning Jesus over later in the evening. So he asks the 11 to to wait around and, and to keep watch and, and to pray. And we know that, that that didn't happen. They end up falling asleep. But he moves aside and he starts kneeling down and, and praying in an anguish. And before he could face Satan and sin on the cross, he's got something else he's got to face. He's got to settle a struggle within him. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 41 it says, he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, not, yet not my will, but yours be done. So Jesus deliberately chooses to accept himself, within himself, the full consequences of human rebellion. Mike Green kind of connects this back to the Garden of Eden, saying that the, the first couple was in community with God, but yet they forsook their connection in the rebellion. And because of this, they lost their kingdom relationship and also their, their kingdom calling, the right to represent him. And so within their rebellion, they end up, they, they came from uh, and were separated from his presence. And they're estranged from the community. And of course, Jesus comes to reverse this, to bring it all back to the way it once was. And he, he agrees to pay the penalty for our sin in, in this separation surrendering his life for our life. And as this inner battle was, was being waged and won in the darkness of the garden there, Jesus is there and is wrestling through this and says, you know, he starts sweating like, like drops of blood coming down. And he's wrestling through all this. And at this point, Judas shows up leading the soldiers to betray Jesus. And the, and the disciples wake up and, you know, Peter's kind of figuring out what's going on. They're surrounded. He grabs his sword and just starts swinging. And if you remember, Malchus, the, the poor servant of the high priest, loses his ear. Jesus scoops it up and brings about this restoration to Malchus, proving for everyone there what he was about. And he tells Peter, put up the sword. The battle will not be won in this way, and the kingdom will be not be won in this matter. But by going to the cross, Jesus was able, in essence, to tell another to put away his sword. The one I'm talking about is the angel that stood at the entrance to the Garden of Eden. He's able to say, put up your sword. For all this time, man has been separated from God. Peter, put up your sword. But angel, it's time to put that away. I'm ready to, to blaze that trail and to reconnect God with his people. So that's what the kingdom is all about. And so in the Garden of, of Gethsemane, we have the first battle of new humanity was won by Jesus. So as we prepare to take up these emblems, we proclaim goodness of our king. We proclaim the new kingdom that he came to establish and pursue our calling as his subjects.